Welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. So I have been gone for a little bit. I had my baby obviously on October 5th and he was born a fighter. He was in the NICU initially and he's nursing right now and he's been in the NICU a couple of times now and he will need a few surgeries to go through it. That's the gist of it. I was a mess. Um, I am feeling a lot better now. The outlook looks good for him. Um, but I'm back. I'm here. I'm going to tell you the story of what happened. I have some unboxings. You can see I placed a VIB sale order with Sephora and I have my FabFitFun box there. I hope to get to those. We will see. It's still kind of, I'm still learning to juggle the two under two. I have an 18 month old and my now six week old. Um, and we have to deal with his special needs and everything. So hopefully I can get back on board with all of my beauty videos pretty soon. Um, but right now I just have a little bit of time to tell you about the story and what happened and to say hello and all of that. So I want to say that if you are searching for NICU stories and just because you're in this situation and if you are, I'm so sorry I feel connected to you in a way that I honestly never wanted to feel connected to anybody with a baby in the NICU. It is a horrible, horrible feeling. Um, gosh, I didn't think I would get teary at all uh, because I have, I feel a lot better and he actually slept through the night last night, so I slept well too, but um, my, but if you are searching for videos like this and for things to relate to, just so you know, my son was born full term. He wasn't in the NICU for months and months he, for, for reasons of being a preemie. He was born full term. There was something mechanically wrong. Um, anyway, so just in case that's what you're looking for, he's not, he wasn't in the NICU for that reason. So here is my birth story and my NICU story and what's going on now. Uh, I, for with my first son, my labor was incredibly fast. I went into labor at 11 p.m. and he was born by 1 a.m. We barely made it to the hospital. So with this one, I just kept on harping on the doctor saying, you know, telling her that story and saying, how do I make sure I get to the hospital in time? And at my last appointment with her, uh, she checked me and I was four and a half centimeters dilated and I didn't really, I kind of felt it over the previous few weeks. It's almost like my body is in labor for a long time because I would feel myself dilating here and there. I would feel slight little twinges and a lot of Braxton Hicks. So my body goes into labor, I think, differently than what's known as typical. The nurse, the delivery nurse said I had an atypical cervix, which was cute. Um, and so I was four and a half centimeters and she said, if you feel anything else throughout the day, that was a morning appointment. She said, if you feel any more twinges, anything else, you go to labor and delivery. And so I did. And so that night, like at 10 PM or something, maybe a little earlier, like eight or 9 PM, my husband and I went to labor and delivery and I told them what had happened, what the doctor said, and that I had felt more twinges and that I needed to be checked. And they checked me and they said, you're still at four and a half centimeters, so we're gonna send you home. And I told them, well, I deliver very quickly and they still were inclined to send me home, but they said, we'll keep you for an hour and we'll see if you progress at all. And then we'll send you home if you don't. And they were so sure that I wasn't going to progress. And they checked me after an hour and I was at six to seven centimeters. And honestly, I think the way this nurse checked me might have moved things along because she was pretty rough. When my doctor checked me, she was so gentle. It was like nothing even happened. But this nurse and all of the nurses in labor and delivery, all of the nurses, only one out of two people checked me in labor and delivery and they were rough. I don't know why my doctor was so gentle and they were still able to check anyway. So she was rough and I think the way she checked me moved things along, which was good. I, I, I was grateful for it because I didn't want to have my baby in the car. I wanted to be at the hospital. It felt so good to be at the hospital and get admitted and not be in screaming pain labor. And so she says, okay, we're going to admit you. And I, she asked me if I wanted an epidural and I just immediately said, no, I'm not. For some reason, they don't 
I could do a separate video about this, about epidurals, but I just don't want epidurals and it's totally fine. It hurts. If you're considering an epidural, get an epidural. It hurts because it hurts. <laughs> but um, for me, I just, the intuitive answer is that I don't want one. And I, again, I can do a separate video talking more about that. But I, um, so I said no. So she said, okay, great. So she got me all checked in and she was, she was running around uh, getting things ready really quickly because just in case I progressed quickly, she wanted to be prepared. So that was really nice. Um, she checked me again. I was at seven to eight centimeters. I wasn't feeling anything. I, I, I personally, so this is lucky for me that I don't want an epidural. If it, if I was in a great deal of pain starting at four centimeters or even sooner, I might have caved and gotten an epidural. But for me, it, it just, it doesn't make sense for me personally. Um, so she's, so I'm at seven to eight centimeters and we're like, great. Okay. They checked me again in about an hour or two and I still wasn't feeling any pain. Well, I mean, that's not true. There was a little bit of pain. Um, and I was still at seven to eight centimeters. So the doctor, or she was the nurse midwife. She said, we can break your water and move this along. Um, and I was hesitant just because part of my not wanting an epidural is that I want it to be natural, but I don't know. And it also just, I don't know. I just, I was just like, I don't know. And, and I was like, okay, I guess. And then she said, I don't want to do this on, I guess. She's like, I want you to say yes. So we can let you wait a little bit longer and we can see. And I said, okay, let's wait a little bit longer. See if I progress. And we, they gave me two more hours and they came back and I was still at seven to eight centimeters. And they said, okay, what do you think now? Break your water. And I said, do you recommend it? And they were like, absolutely. <laughs> I said, okay, go ahead, break my water. So they broke my water and that was, so we went to the hospital about uh, 8 or 9 p.m., broke my water, I want to say at about 2.30 a.m. Gosh, I really wish that I had paid more attention to what time it was. I think it was about 2.30 a.m. And then he was born at 4.11 a.m. So once they break your water, if you're, if you're a mother and you've had this happen, it goes quite quickly. Uh, I then started to really feel the pains. They break your water and then I went into active labor and that was when it was it hurt. It hurt a lot. And I was just, I had re watched some YouTube videos on breathing through labor and how to make it more easy for you. Um, and so I was just breathing. I got through it. I started, uh, okay, so let's, let's back up a little bit. I progressed to about nine centimeters quite quickly and she checked my cervix and she was trying to see if she could work my cervix around the baby so that I could start pushing and so she oh this this was hard she was like okay let's see if you push if your cervix will work around the baby and we can just get you started and I did start and she was like okay stop 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 this was what was hard S stopping pushing when she started <laughs> is quite hard to hold the baby there and, but I, I had, that was why I had looked at so many breathing videos. I highly recommend if, especially if you aren't going to get an epidural, look, practice your breathing because it'll be so important in when they, they tell you to stop pushing at times and it is so hard to stop pushing and only through breathing, breathing was I able to, with this baby, with, with my first baby, they would tell me, and I was like, I can't, I don't know how to stop pushing. Um, and because I couldn't stop and I couldn't let my firstborn stretch me, I tore. I had second degree tears and they were pretty painful to recover from. And those are the most common tears, so I can't imagine having worse tears. But I was able to, through breathing, stop when they told me to stop. And he was born and I had first degree tears and just needed a few stitches. It took 10 or 15 minutes to stitch me up but I recovered really easily from that. And I'll mention, talk a little bit more about that later, but he was born at 4.11 a.m. And he is a big, a big little guy. He's nine pounds. He was born nine pounds, 10 ounces. He's already 12 and a half pounds, maybe more. Uh, his last weigh-in, he was 12 pounds, seven ounces. Um, 
so he was born nine pounds, 10 ounces. And I'm kind of wondering if I had a misdiagnosis of gestational diabetes, because I had that with my firstborn, but that's also another story. So, uh, and then he latched right away. Like within 15 minutes of being born, he latched, he was eating, everything looked really good. And we go and I get admitted to a recovery room and he's eating great. And 12 hours after he was born, so 4 p.m. in the afternoon, he eats for the last time. He eats and he eats for about 10 minutes. It wasn't very long, but I was, I was still nursing my toddler. I'm still nursing my toddler, my 18 month old. So I figured I had a lot of milk and he got full really quickly. At the next feeding after that, like at 7 p.m., he refused to eat. He not only wouldn't latch, it was like he went like this with his lips. He was like, F no, you are not putting anything else in my stomach. And that I knew was quite strange. I knew he should have been very hungry three hours later. And he, the, so I asked the nurse what was going on. And she said, well, sometimes they can swallow a lot when they're being born. Maybe there's just a lot in his stomach. Just try to rub some colostrum in his mouth because they were also checking his blood sugar. They, if a baby that is born over nine and a half pounds, nine pounds, eight ounces, so nine pounds, 10 ounces my baby was, they check their blood sugar in case there's a missed diagnosis of uh, gestational diabetes because they could have hypoglycemia. And so they were checking his blood sugar. So in order for his blood sugar checks to move forward, I needed to make sure that I was feeding him. And so they said, just rub some colostrum in his mouth that will do the trick. They said, I've seen that make the baby's blood sugars be just fine. Mm. So I was doing that and throughout the night, same deal. Oh. And then he starts really fussing. He had been, he had had a great attitude, was really oh. pretty calm. And then I thought I was going to get some sleep after um, the seven o'clock feeding. And then he started uh, fussing, uh, a few hours later, I, he was all wrapped. I was all laying down, ready to sleep. And he started, it was like he was in pain fussing. Um, and there, if if I had been a first time mom, I may not have been as in tune and I may not have noticed anything was wrong. Um, but because I have a toddler, an 18 month old, I keep saying it that way, because I have an 18 month old, I was a little more in tune and it sounded like pain when he would fuss and so I held him I tried to feed him I thought maybe he is hungry and I'm wrong he again refused and then he projectile vomited on me and it came out of his nose and he was burping like crazy and I just was like this is so weird and again if I had been a first time mom I might have thought that that was spit up but because I have had a baby I know that spit up kind of just gurgles out and it doesn't smell it doesn't smell at all or it smells maybe a little sweet like milk but uh this smelled like vomit so I knew he had vomited and a newborn baby shouldn't be vomiting um so there was that and then he just seemed increasingly uncomfortable he was burping like crazy and I kept asking the nurses and they kept just saying, hopefully it's just that he swallowed a lot of stuff, keep rubbing colostrum in his mouth and talk to the pediatrician in the morning when they make rounds. So the pediatrician comes by to make rounds. It's maybe 9 a.m. And I just say to her, I am so glad to see you. I tell her everything that's been going on. She checks him out and she says, oh yes, his belly is distended. She asks me some questions. And then she says, we're going to pump his stomach and see if that just kind of resets him and he should get hungry right away. And if he doesn't eat within 30, 45 minutes, then we're gonna take an x-ray and we're gonna see if we see anything wrong. And I said, okay, great, let's do it. And so we did it, pumped his stomach, he didn't wanna eat, took an x-ray and they found blockage. So he had intestinal blockage. Um, she asked me, has he been pooping or farting? And I said, one nurse said he had a little bit of meconium when she changed his diaper. Well, actually I'm, I said, one nurse had he said he had meconium when he changed, she changed his diaper. I didn't actually see it. She said that it started to come out or something like that. Uh, so it sounded like there was only a little bit. Uh, meconium, if you don't know, is the baby's first poop. It's not actual poop. Um, it's what they have in their system from being in the in utero and it gets cleared out in the first few days of their life. And so 
Uh, he hadn't really been pooping or fire farting. He was totally blocked. So she said, we're going to admit him to the NICU and we're going to come back and talk to you in soon. I mean, in the next, I think they were there again within an hour to talk to me and tell me that he needed to be transferred to another hospital that had surgeons on call because uh, any kind of intestinal blockage in an infant needs to be addressed right away. And it uh, very often it requires surgery. And I was just beside myself. I, oh my God. <laughs> so they put him, they put him with a transport team and the transport team came by my room to show me that he was okay. He was in a portable incubator type thing. I don't know if that's what they're called, but, um, and there were like six people they were all had a different reason for being on the transport team so he it was well staffed i was happy to see that i was not happy that he was having to go to the NICU but i was really really happy that it was being dealt with so swiftly and they took me seriously and and they were on it it was really really great although i was just coming apart more and more and um and I had told my husband to go home after Nico was born, go home to our son because my my mother was watching him. And I said, go relieve my mother and then just come pick us up when the 24 hours is over. And so my husband wasn't there and he, he came. So he came to pick me up with our son and we went to the NICU, the, the hospital he was transferred to, to go see him. Oh my gosh, and he was in so much pain. His belly looked like a balloon and there were just people buzzing all around him. I I was I had no sleep for 2 days, so I was it's kind of a dreamlike memory. Um and also it was just so painful to see. And he was just screaming and um yeah, uh so we left him there that night and I came home, I had to pump. He was in, so essentially he was in the NICU for five days um, while they did tests to figure out what had gone on. And they did all of the tests. There's kind of a checklist and they, everything was clearing. And so they were thinking it was just a meconium plug, basically that he was born very, very constipated and needed an enema. And my fingers were crossed that that was what it was because then no surgery, no long-term care. Um, and they let us take him home. Um, he had started to poop on his own some after the enema and the excavation and the endoscopy where they go in through the butt with a scope and a camera to see what's going on. And so that he had started eating um, breast milk. He nursed fine on day three and he was passing poop. So they let me take him home after five days and he um and he was still doing all of that and farting at home when we first got him home hi sweetie pie oh yeah oh my goodness he's starting to smile and it's really really sweet are you done nursing for now should i take a break telling the story okay let's take a break Okay, so I have him at home and there's one pending test that is out there after, I don't know how long, but uh, so about a week after he's born, I get a call from the doctor. Good birth <laughs> with the results and that he, um, his pathology was consistent with Hirschsprung's disease. So he has what's called Hirschsprung's disease, which means the, basically the cells that are in our intestines that help us move poop along they when when a baby's in utero they form starting at the mouth and then travel down all the way through to the anus so that's when they're created those cells that help move everything along and in Hirschsprung's disease those cells stop forming um usually somewhere in the colon um some I believe always always somewhere in the colon or they don't make it to the colon. Anyway, I believe it only affects the colon. So his cells stopped forming um, right at, toward the end of his colon. So only a short piece of his colon was affected. Um, he has had his first surgery 
and he's doing great. He's recovered. He needs two more surgeries to uh, help fix it. Well, they can't fix it. They need to take out the part of his colon that doesn't have those cells and then bring down the healthiest, the healthy part of his colon that does have those cells and connect that to his anus. So he um, will potentially never be able to go the same way that he, I can, uh, but, <laughs> but he, uh, <laughs> he, um, <laughs> he's so cute. Um, he, there's kind of a 50, 50 chance that he'll, it, he'll feel like normal and have a normal pooping lifestyle. And there's a 50% chance that he'll just kind of need to learn his normal and he could have issues with constipation later in life but the outcome from the surgery the outlook looks pretty good and if he hadn't if this hadn't have been caught it can, can potentially be fatal or just he would have a lifetime of extreme discomfort it would be debilitating so i'm really happy that i was able to be of that in tune with what was going on with him. Like I said, had I been a first time mother, I might have just thought he was a fussy baby and that it was spit up and not, I wouldn't have known that not wanting to eat wasn't normal. Um, so I w I'm really glad that I was able to, to be in tune with it and, um, and that they were, they, the doctors listened to me so, so carefully because had I not said anything, he had passed a little bit of meconium and that's basically all they want to see. They just want to see that the baby poops and that they're, that they're eating okay. Um, but they might have let me take him home. Um, I know that a lot of babies who, or, or people who are diagnosed with Hirschsprungs, it's, it's a fight to figure out what's wrong. A lot of the doctors have asked me, how did you know? How did you know? Um, because babies are often just colicky or you know fussy babies they don't sleep well and and you know mothers are trying to figure out what is wrong with their diet why their baby is reacting poorly to their breast milk when it's actually something mechanical um you know when the baby's on solids a lot of people are just trying to figure out what's what to do about their diet I don't know why this isn't something that they just test for as a standard. It's considered rare. Um, one in 5,000 babies are born with it. Um, but apparently it's not easy to detect and diagnose. So I feel really, really thankful that we figured it out this early on and we're gonna get him as comfortable as he possibly can be uh, for the rest of his life. So yes, he will need two more surgeries. His next surgery is January 10th, and then there will be another surgery six weeks after that. Just They're doing it in stages to make sure everything heals as well as possible before they do the next thing. Uh, they've learned that long-term outcomes doing it this way are far superior than if they just did everything at once. So they're, they're being very cautious and um, doing it like this. Uh, so this is him. This is my little guy. My husband and I have generally made the decision not to put the children on YouTube, which I totally agree with. You know, it's, I, I, no shame on anyone who puts their children on YouTube, but for us, it's kind of just like, we can't ask them if they're okay with that. And it's going to be out there for the rest of their lives potentially. So this is probably the most you're going to see of him, but this is Nico and, uh, he's, thriving otherwise and I miss you guys so much again I have those boxes over there to unbox the big one is a Costco return ignore that one but the there's a Sephora box and Fat Fit Fun box on top of it and hopefully I'll be able to get around to um doing those videos and I have a ton of products in my in my groggy nights of nursing him I have been doing so much online shopping it is the year time of year for sales on beauty products and you know there was a sephora vib sale i spent like i spent like 400 dollars on stuff from sephora and then i just spent like 200 dollars on ulta black friday and you know what i'm justifying it because i just went through a lot i had a baby it's my 
It's my push present to myself. I don't know if you know what a push present is, but it's basically the present you get from your partner when you have a baby. Um, if you have a partner, uh, they should get you a push present for having their child. And so it's my push present to myself is what I'm telling myself. <laughs> but that said, I will have a ton of beauty products to review. I have a bunch of empties that I've acquired. I have, I want to tell you about this stuff that's on my lips. It's a Tower 28 lip gloss from a Sephora beauty box, Sephora favorites box. Anyway, I have a lot of beauty products I want to tell you about. I want to paint my nails. I need to wrap presents. I need to do so much. Anyway, so, <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I am clearly doing much better. I couldn't film. I didn't have the wherewithal at all. So I did miss doing my last two FabFitFun review videos. Um, so I'm sorry about that. I'll get back to doing those. Um, another thing is that I, I subscribed to BoxyCharm for like three months. Uh, and I canceled because I just didn't like what I was getting in the boxes and I wasn't using it. But... I still get access to the sales. So if you want access to other sales, and BoxyCharm is very different than FabFitFun sales. I like them. I like them better. I like them about the same, but they're different. So if you want access to the BoxyCharm sales, subscribe to their base box, box for one month and then you get access to the BoxyCharm sales. So I'm thinking about doing BoxyCharm sale videos too, but we'll see. Uh, that might be just down the road. But if you're interested in that, let me know in the comments below. And um, yeah, I also have a bunch of product beauty products that I want to declutter that I have tried, but they aren't for me, but other people might like them. And I've asked this on my channel before, and a few of you said you'd be interested in this, but I might do a giveaway because I would, I'll donate those products. I'll donate those products, but maybe, I mean, a lot of them are things that I've tried two or three times and I've just decided they're not for me, but maybe you want to give them a try and I might do a giveaway that's like that. Maybe that's kind of ghetto, maybe that's kind of funky, but if you'd be into that and you would enter, let me know as well. Um, a couple of you said okay last time, but anyway, so um, that's it, uh, that's about it. I it's not as messy behind me as I think. We have other boxes here too. A lot of, that's, that's his crib. We ordered his crib, so we have to put that together. I think that's his crib. There, are, There's also like a baby table over there. So we've been spending a lot of money on baby stuff too. Um, I feel like I'm rambling at this point. I It's because I missed you guys. It's because I really missed you all. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's my that's my Nikki story. I am feeling so much better. I have, It's great that I get to have him here at home through his treatment for the most part. He'll just, he'll be in the, probably the PICU, which is the pediatric ICU, um, since he will be over two months for the next couple of surgeries, over two months old. So he'll probably be in the PICU, uh, he'll be in the PICU for three days at least after each surgery because they need to make sure that he is uh, eating and stooling okay for at least 24 hours and so they'll put him they'll put, they'll keep him um npo which means nothing per nothing he can't eat anything they'll keep him without eating anything for a day then they'll try letting him eat for a day and then they'll make sure that he starts pooping and he's eating and everything looks good and then i can take him home so fingers crossed for the next two surgeries the next surgery is actually the biggest surgery where they're going to be doing the most to his insides Oh, the most to his insides. Um, and then the last surgery will be just kind of like one final wrap up thing and he wants to eat some more. So um, anyway, that's it. Thank you for watching. I have missed you so much again and I hope to get back to regular beauty videos as soon as possible. And I love you. If you haven't subscribed, consider subscribing and say hello in the comments below and I will see you in my next video. Bye.